the presentation starts, but um, all right, looks like we're live. We got people coming in. Welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us. Uh, what kind of beer you got there, Ken? Well, actually, I've got a medallia. A medallia? What's a medallia? Yeah. That is a Mexican beer. Ah, nice. That is. Oh, a Modelo. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yep, yeah, yeah. And I have it in a nice frosty mug. Frosty mug. There you go. That's, uh, I, I think Mode Modelo now is, um, Modelo, Modelo, maybe I'm not saying it right. It's, uh, I think, the third highest beer by volume in Chicago. It's hugely popular in the city. Yeah. There's um, uh, a large Latin com or a Latino community, and I, I think they like it. And then uh, on top of that, I think they've benefited tremendously from people not drinking Corona anymore. Yeah, uh, they're Because, yeah, that's, yeah. I noticed that Corona pulled all their commercials off because I, I don't think uh, now is the time to, uh, uh, to kind of go that way. So yeah. um, anyway, I'm drinking, for anyone in the crowd who cares, I'm drinking a, a Bell's Two-Hearted Ale. Uh, Bell's is in Michigan. Uh, they're one of the larger craft breweries in in uh, in America. Actually, they are one of the few holdouts. Uh, so if you if you follow craft brewing history at all, um, the first sort of wave of these craft brewers was in the later '80s, early '90s, as I recall, uh, and then they kind of grew into the 2000s, starting with Goose Island in the in the mid to late 2000s. I think 2008, um, uh, uh, Goose Island. Uh, sold a majority of it to, uh, to Anheuser-Busch and then a number of followed suit. It was sort of an arms race and Bell's was one of the few that held out, never sold out. And, uh, they make a great beer and we're, uh, I'm looking forward to enjoying it as we talk about, uh, uh, combating corrosion and, uh, and how we can use some special alloy fittings to do that. Uh, I'm fortunate today to have Ken Kimbrell, who I'm sure many of you know. Uh, Ken is the special product manager, uh, the special alloys ma product manager at v &E. He's also the chair of the ASME BP, so he brings a, a wealth of knowledge and experience uh, uh, to us today. Hopefully, everyone can hear me. Um, uh, let's see, we got one panelist, Brian Diffley, he, who works here. He says he's got a sawtooth ale by Left Hand Brewing. That's a good beer. I've had that one. But, um, uh, I guess without too much further ado, one more thing I did want to mention, uh, we are recording the webinar. So for anyone who misses it or wants to go back and review something, we will be posting this on our YouTube page. Uh, you can also contact me directly and I can send you a copy of it if you're interested. So without further ado, I will uh, turn it over to you, Ken, and uh, uh, we look forward to learning some more about, about your products. Okay, thanks, Andy. I appreciate everybody being here. Um, so we're going to start off with a little bit about v &E before we get into the real educational stuff. Uh, most people probably already know uh, who v &E is, but you may not be aware of the how far reaching uh, our company actually goes. So um, with that said, we'll see if this goes like it's supposed to. Uh, so v &E is actually part of the Numo Ehrenberg group of companies. We're a group of companies that's based in 16 different co countries worldwide. We are a privately held company based in uh, Nittlingen, Germany, and we have manufacturing locations in Germany, Israel, and Janesville, Wisconsin. Overall, we have 1,500 employees worldwide in 26 different uh, companies. This is our uh, ASME BPE fabrication facility that we have in Israel. Uh, you'll notice we're certification number 102. And what's really important about this, this is where all of our BPE product is fabricated, whether that be from 300 series austenitic steel to the special alloys uh, when it comes to our certified product. And that is one of the things that we are offering in special alloys is certified ASME BPE product. And we'll get into that and what that means here shortly. Uh, as far as V&E Corporation, uh, you may be familiar that we're in Janesville, Wisconsin, started in 1980. We have about 55,000 square feet uh, facility under roof with 71 employees. We have manufacturing, sales, and administration at this particular location. Uh, we have marketing and sales responsibilities for USA, Canada, Mexico, South America, and Puerto Rico. And we also have multiple divisions. We have a, a tooling division uh, known as uh, Vargas Tooling. We also have a uh, electro polishing facility in Lake Katrina, New York, uh, high purity technologies, which focuses more on uh, small diameter and uh, uh, specialty products. This is uh, 
one of the things that we do with, with our particular products is that we have a lot of automated equipment that we utilize during our fabrication. Unlike what you might see there on the left when it comes to the hand polishing, most of our polishing is all done by automated equipment. Therefore, we're able to offer a precise and repeatable surface finish on the products that we offer. Uh, so one thing about the BPE uh, facilities is they are audited and you're guaranteed to get that same quality throughout uh, the process. We also offer uh, square end facing on all of our uh, products so that when they do come in, they do fit up properly and they do weld. You could have good square ends on those. You don't have to go back and worry about any type of facing in order to get those to fit up. So uh, like I said, uh, all this is done through automated equipment. Then we follow that up with a uh, cleaning process, which is a multi-step automated process. We'll go through an agita agitated DI water rinsing, followed by other processes in order to, to keep it uh, clean. We go through a nine-step process of cleaning and passivation of all of our products, uh, our fittings and so forth before they go into packaging. Our product, uh, the MaxCore 6MO product, which is basically, uh, if you're familiar with 6 Molly product, that's more or less an AL6XN. Uh, so the, re the reason that we'll talk about uh, MaxCore 6MO and AL6XN interchangeably is because they do share the same UNS number. Uh, UNS number basically stands for the Unified Numbering System. And in order to have a number classified to it, you have to meet a certain chemistry that is set forth by the ASTM standards. Both our product, MaxCore 6MO and AL6XN have the very same UNS number, which is N08367, which basically means that they meet the same criteria for chemistry of the materials. So in other words, they're identical when it comes to the, the, the product itself. It's just that they're manufactured at different mills. Now, VNE, we offer uh, some of our products are AL6XN, some of our products are, are uh, basically the 6, uh, 6MO product, but it will all be classified under the N08367. So when you're, one of the things I like to talk about when we're uh, talking about specifications, especially to those of you that are with engineering companies, is one of the things that I really would like to see, and this is from a, a BPE standpoint, at the BPE standard, one of the things that we have uh, standardized on is the use of UNS numbers and not materials. So if you happen to look at the BPE standard, for instance, you'll read statements in there that now read like 316L type material. Not 316L material, but 316L type. And the reason that we do that is because with the European steels today, there are different materials that meet the same UNS chemistry uh, that goes along with that. So in writing specifications, one of the things that I would recommend that you do is get away from calling out material types and start calling out the UNS numbers. And the reason for that is that, like I said, it does guarantee the chemistry of the material which is gonna give you the corrosion resistance and weldability properties that you're looking for. So as you're moving forward in specification writing, that's something to keep in mind. Now, in our particular product of our MaxCore products, what you're gonna find is, uh, you're gonna find in this particular case, if you look uh, right in this area here, you can actually see that uh, we've got a ASME BPE marking located right here that will be all of our ASME BPE product that will actually show the ASME symbol along with the certification number of the facility where it was located showing it is a certified product. You'll also find all the markings on there as far as the specifications uh, and everything else that's listed on there. And in our tubing, you'll see something along the lines that reads with all the, the uh, information as far as uh, who the manufacturer of the tubing is, what the size is, the max core 6MO, the UNS number, any other specification that goes along with that, and the ASME BPE certified mark along with the surface finish call outs and, and all the other information that goes along with it. So all of that information is listed on the product itself. Ken, can I just ask two really quick questions or maybe sure. make one point and ask you to confirm it and then ask a couple of quick questions. So it, it sounds like to me, uh, AL6XN then is really more of a marketing uh, designation than it is a uh, actual material type. What we really need to focus on is using that UNS number. Is that right? That is correct. So AL6XN is basically a trade name. Uh, 
Right. It's like it's like Kleenex or puffs or anything else. So where that comes from is AL stands for Allegheny Ludlum, which is the, the producing mill. Six stands for the 6% molybdenum. X is the internal symbol that Allegheny had for molybdenum. And N stands for the nitrogen addition. That's where the trade name AL6XN comes from. It's really nothing more than, than just a trade name of the material itself. It doesn't guarantee anything other than that. So uh, it, by focusing on the UNS number, what you're focusing on is the chemistry of the material, which is going to be your chromium, molybdenum, nickel contents, and those types of things that's listed there, which we'll look at here a little bit later on in this presentation. And, and you might be getting into it, so maybe I'm jumping the gun, but all of your 6MO fittings are bagged just like your uh, BP, your standard 316L BP fittings, which means they come with a QR code. And if I ever need to pull up a cert, all I have to do is scan that QR code and it's going to take me right to it. Yep, you're gonna, we're going to get there in just one second. There you go. All right. So uh, whenever you get one of our fittings with that, you're going to find that uh, we have diode laser etching located on the, uh, the product itself, uh, away from the bag, but on the, on the piece of material that actually shows the job number, material type, surface finish, designation, trade names, etc. All that information is laser etched on the material itself. And one of the things that we're also doing is we're color coding our particular product so that you you're, okay. can, can easily and visually identify that from something different than 316L stainless steel. So all of our BPE fittings uh, will come with color coded caps uh, in our six molly product that shows white is electro polished and orange is mechanically polished. So that's just for quick identification to say, hey, that's got a different color cap than this 300 series product that we have. And then as, as Andy had mentioned, everything comes bagged uh, with the QR codes listed on there and the information listed uh, that's easily accessible through the website. So you can actually scan that QR code, which will take you to our website. Uh, and you can actually pull up that mill test report in the field if you need it at that point in time, just from scanning that QR code. Very easily accessible, uh, and it gives you that information uh, right away, so you don't have to have a bunch of paperwork following you around. You have it there just in the bag itself. So, is there, is there if I get into the field, Ken, is and I and I lose the caps, which I often do. I guess first of all, what color are the caps on the three sixteen L fittings? Uh, is there are, are those blue? Am I a right? lot of times they 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 can be different colors. There there's uh, some green, there's uh -huh. some black, you know, different things. But we are specifically in this case, uh, you know, we're making sure that we're keeping these color coded caps, uh, you know, and we're trying to standardize on that in house. If if I lose the cap, is there any other way to figure out if it's a 316L fitting or a... So it's gonna be, yeah, it's going to be marked on the fitting itself. It's going to it have is. the material uh, listed on the material. Uh, so yes, it okay. will be marked. Okay. It's just, the, the caps are just strictly there for nothing but just quick identification. Right. If you happen to, you can be standing three feet away and look at it and say, okay, that's a special fitting. Yeah, yeah, that's that's really helpful for fabricators like us when we're staging these jobs. You know, we don't want to look at every single fitting, but if we can quickly identify on the carts, okay, this is the 6MO cart, only red and orange caps over here versus, you know, everything else. That's a really quick, easy way, I think, to help keep, keep uh, help people keep their sanity. Because it's, sure. it, it, the stuff goes all over the place when you're running these really big jobs. It really does. Well, and it, it helps us as well. When we're looking at our particular products and we're pulling uh, items, uh, you know, it helps us to, to keep it uh, clear as, as, you know, ourselves. So. Yep. Uh, so moving forward, why are we using this particular product? And the biggest reason that we do is because of corrosion. Uh, this is what we're all uh, dealing with right now. So, and I, that, I just want to interrupt really quickly. Yep. I'm sorry. Uh, we have a we have two points. One from your colleague John uh, John Georgian, who uh, I know pretty well. Uh, he's our uh, local regional guy, and I, I mm -hmm. spent a lot of time working with John. So I'm glad he could join us this afternoon. John says that red are for EP and yellow is for mechanical. Uh, is standard for 316L as well. So if you got a red cap, you know it's EP'd, and if you get a yellow cap, you know it's, it's mechanical finish. And then Alex asks, do the caps conform to industry standards uh, versus your own identification? So is that a V&E thing, or is that an industry standard thing? That's a V&E thing when it comes to what we're putting on our, on our caps, yeah. Okay. Very good. All right. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. No, that's okay. And I'm glad John was on there because obviously my focus is on alloys, so I, I didn't know what colors we were using on the other items. 
So, John doesn't miss a whole lot. John, does, John not does not miss a whole lot. Absolutely. So when we're talking about corrosion, uh, and this is where we start getting into the fun stuff, uh, it's approximately, corrosion is about $300 billion per year in cost. And that's about one third of the cost, uh, or about one third of this cost could be reduced by broader applications of corrosion control and materials and best corrosion related practices. Uh, this was a study that was done uh, called a Patel study. And virtually all premature corrosion fail failures occur for reasons which we are already know about. Um, and these failures can typically be pre prevented. Um, you know, we, we typically know that we've got corrosion problems taking place somewhere within our system. And a lot of times we'll go right back with a 316L stainless steel product when we know that it's going to end up failing. Uh, so, you know, the, a lot of times we know that we're going to have some issues. Some of the direct costs contributed to corrosion failures are excessive maintenance, repairs, and replacements, uh, loss production and downtime, product contamination, uh, loss of product, loss of efficiency, and what we mean by that is by oversizing uh, and, and ex excess of uh, thicker materials, energy costs, accidents, increased capital costs, and overdesign, and environmental cleanups. When you stop and think about this, how quickly some of this can add up, if you're a pharmaceutical company and you have a corrosion issue taking place and it causes you to shut down, uh, that lost production downtime and that possible product contamination can, can be in the millions of dollars very, very quickly. So, you know, when you're looking at, at looking at these costs and going to higher alloys for these types of applications, it doesn't take a lot to offset those costs when you get right down to it. And, and I can add to that, you know, as a, as a stainless steel fabricator and distributor, the quickest way that I've seen for us to lose credibility with our customers is if we sell them something or if we fabricate something for them where there's rust. You know, rust, it, it's, it's ugly when people see it. They, it, you know, all everyone circles around it and there's no quicker way that I've seen to destroy credibility with our customers than to, than, than when a corrosion uh, problem comes up, that's for yep. certain. Absolutely. So what causes the corrosion cell? You basically have to have four things. You have to have an anode. That's the area that gives up the electron. That's where corrosion actually occurs. You have to have a cathode. That's the area that receives or consumes the electron. You have to have a metallic path, which is that's how the, they're transported. And then you have to have an electrolyte. Uh, which actually transport the ions. By controlling any four of those, you can eliminate corrosion. So let's stop and think about what we're talking about here. When you're talking about an anode and you're talking about a 300 series stainless steel, you're talking about an area on a tank, for instance, that has the passive layer that has been damaged and compromised. That is no longer a, a passive area of stainless steel and therefore that gives off those electrons and becomes your anode. Your cathode is the area that receives that, which is the area right next to that. It's the metal that's still in the passive state. And then your metallic path is basically just the metal. It's the plane that the two are lying in and your electrolyte is your product or whatever uh, you have coming in contact with that. That could be plant water, whatever it could possibly be. So whenever you have corrosion taking place in these applications, it can happen on that one surface. I would, imagine, I would imagine Gatorade's got to use a lot of AL6XN. I mean, that stuff that. is electrolytes, right? Yep. Yeah, absolutely. There's all kinds of uh, things out there you don't think about uh, that, that can use this. You know, things along the lines of, uh, you know, when you're talking about products for uh, six moly alloys that look at the corrosion resistance, you're talking about things like Gatorade, like you said. You're talking about soy sauces, hot sauces, tomato products. Uh, of course, our buffer solutions that we use in pharmaceutical applications. Uh, you know, heavy salt products like using salt sprays for seasonings and so forth. So there's all types of, of things that uh, where chlorides are involved uh, that, that use this. So if you're looking at the corrosion process, you can see here in this little diagram, the anode, the cathode, the electrolyte, and the, the uh, uh, metallic path. And you can kind of see how that all works together. Your anode will actually give up the metal ion going towards the, the cathode, your metallic path is the metal itself, and then your electrolyte is your product. So it's, it's a pretty simple uh, thing here. But what we're really gonna talk about, there are actually five main types of corrosion. 
Uh, general corrosion, which happens across the entire surface of the steel, and a granular corrosion, which happens in between the grain boundaries of the steel. We're going to concentrate more on galvanic corrosion, which is pitting and crevice corrosion, because that's typically what we experience in our industry. Uh, you also have stress corrosion, cracking, and MIC corrosion. Like I said, we're going to concentrate on, for this particular uh, presentation, the galvanic corrosion. That is a classic electrochemical cell that is accelerated by the potential differences in the metals uh, when they come in contact and they're exposed to electrolyte and they have an adjoining path. True galvanic corrosion is something along the lines where you have differential metals put together like a carbon steel bolted to a stainless steel, for instance. For stainless steel, is going to be more uh, uh, cathodic than your carbon steel. Pitting is a corrosion where both active and passive cells exist on the same metal, and crevice is where an active cell is artificially forced to exist, and we're going to kind of look at those. Now, when we're talking about galvanic potentials, this is the chart showing the galvanic differential between active stainless steel and passive stainless steel. So if you notice, uh, active stainless steel gives off a negative 0.44 volts of electricity, whereas the passive stainless steel gives off a positive 0.34 volts. That's a differential of 0.78 volts differential between active stainless steel and passive stainless steel. So that's your differential that's taking place whenever you have those in the same plane. So pitting corrosion can be defined as an extreme case of localized attack, which can result uh, and develop deep cavities and pits on the surface of the steel. Uh, they can range anywhere from a very small diameter to the very, very deep pits within the surface. And quite often, the larger pit on the metal surface, uh, or the larger part of the metal surface remains unchanged. It's in a, just in a specific area where you might have this corrosion taking place. And this is an example of what that might look like. So you can see here, this is a, a piece of steel that actually shows an, a, an active site of corrosion taking place at this particular area. This is your anode. You have a cathode, which is the undamaged passive steel, which is your cathode. The metal itself is your uh, metallic path. And then when this comes into play with the product, whether that be water, uh, your, your product that you're pumping through, whatever that could possibly be, that's going to serve as your electrolyte. So you have that galvanic differential taking place on the surface of that steel. And whenever you have a pit start to form, it can really uh, uh, drill through material very, very quickly. And we're going to look at that here in just a second. Pitting is something that is very random. In stainless steel, it usually is caused by chlorides. And in our particular cases, a lot of time, high buffer solutions uh, that we use with high chloride contents can also be caused by cleaning solutions, which have certain chlorides and so forth involved. You start thinking about bleach and those types of things that, that a lot of places use for cleaning. Those, those are all, that's chlorine. So you have to stop and think about what that is. Uh, pitting occurs when the passive film breaks down locally. And after the initiation, an anode forms when that film has broken and you have a, a, a unpassive surface there uh, that takes place. Uh, this will accelerate the localized attack uh, and the pits will develop at those anodic spots. And the electrolyte inside that pit may become very, very aggressive. As you start to fill that pit with liquid, you limit the amount of air and contact that happens there, and that can become more concentrated. And when that does, it becomes a more, much more of an accelerant as well. So what can happen during that particular process is you may have a very, very small pit up on top of the surface of the steel, but as this starts to corrode down into the steel, it starts to open up in a teardrop stop type shape. And as this starts to fill with the uh, solution, it becomes more corrosive because of the concentration that's there and you no longer have any type of flow within that type of pit. And as this starts to uh, grow, not only have you got a more uh, aggressive solution, but you also have a much larger anode as that starts to grow. So your anodic site gets bigger and bigger and therefore you have a, a much faster rate of exchange that can take place at that. So whenever you have pitting taking place at that location, a lot of times it can drill through stainless steel very, very quickly and can cause a, a catastrophic failure 
uh, much quicker than you think it can. So a lot of times when you go in and you start to repair something like this, if you're gonna go in and do some mechanical polishing and try to repair this, many times you can start grinding on that and you'll see that pit grow and get much larger. And, and that's the reason, it's because it has eaten out much more of this and become more anodic. So it may, you may end up at some point in time even having to go in and fill those pits with weld material in order to fix that if you're doing a field repair. Is there like a delay, Ken, uh, between when this starts and when we start to visually see it? I feel like sometimes people have a problem long before it's, it's visually apparent. A lot of times you can, yeah. Uh, many times it will, it will uh, look on the, you can look at the surface and you can actually see a, what looks like a orange peel to the surface itself. If you have a nice mechanically polished surface, you can actually see something that looks almost like an orange peel or a discontinuity in color, more of a gray type color. Uh, you can start, you can take a light, uh, uh, a bright white light, and you can shine it on the side of it kind of at an angle, and you can maybe see like little stars on the surface of a tank. That's the indication of micro pitting starting to take place. Now, again, it depends on the material itself, because as material starts to form and solidify, what happens is you have all these alloying elements that, that go into homogenation. And areas, you don't have the same corrosion resistance across the entire surface of that steel. So you're going to have some areas that may be a little bit stronger uh, than other areas. So it depends on, on how it, it actually forms. So, you know, uh, pits can be uh, generated from uh, where the passive layer has been damaged just due to uh, a simple thing as a scratch on the surface of the steel, where somebody has gotten in and walked in on, on it and scratched it and damaged that passive layer, dropping a wrench or a mm -hmm. screwdriver down inside of a tank, uh, or even a, an inclusion from the mill of some type of tramp element uh, that there that doesn't have the same type of uh, corrosion resistance. So there's all types of things that come into play that you have to look at. But the, the real key here is, is that when you do see damage, obviously you can't always shut down and fix it, but it is certainly something to notice and, and take uh, stock of, because if you do have the opportunity to fix it, you're better off to fix it uh, right away. And, and get it taken care of. What's the difference between corrosion and rouging? You know, rouging is that other brown stuff we see sometimes when we crack open these systems. Well, actually, rouging is a byproduct of corrosion. Okay. So, so when you stop and think about stainless steel, stainless steel is an alloy of iron. It has about 64% iron content. So when you stop and think what iron is, iron is basically iron ore. It's rust. Mm -hmm. Okay. So whenever you have corrosion taking place, what happens if you look at this particular pit and you think that 64% of this particular material is iron and you start to let these metal ions go into solution, you're putting 64% iron, uh, sorry, you have 64% iron going into your product. Okay. That's going to turn orange. Mm -hmm. So as you start to have corrosion taking place, that certainly and can impact the mitigation of rouge within your system, and it's going to turn rust color. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. So when you're talking about materials, uh, one of the things that gives you corrosion resistance is the molybdenum content that a material has in it. So if you look at the ASTM standards, 304 stainless steel by by definition has no molybdenum content in it at all. 316 has two to 3% molybdenum content, 904L has 4% molybdenum content, and six moly alloys have 6% molybdenum content. So if you look at this particular uh, chart that we have here, this is a, a test that was done uh, in a laboratory at 84 degrees C. It basically shows on the bottom the pH level of a product, and on the left-hand side of the graph, is the chlorides per parts per million. And the lines going across the graph indicate the amount of molybdenum content that a material might have in that. So if you look at a pH of five, for instance, in this particular graph, and you look at a 316L stainless steel with a two to 3% molybdenum content, you can see that you can withstand about 500 parts per million of chlorides based upon uh, this uh, graph. If you look at that same pH of five and you look at a six moly alloy with a 6% molybdenum content, you'll see that now you can withstand about 6,000 parts per million of chlorides. So you can see that the molybdenum content itself plays a huge part in the resistance when it comes to pitting, and that's what it's designed to do. You can also calculate the pitting resistance of a alloy by the 
chemistry. There is a, a number known as a pitting resistance equivalency number. You calculate that by the percent of chrome plus 3.3 times the percent of molybdenum plus 16 times the percent of nitrogen. And by doing that calculation, the PREN numbers for 304 stainless steel is 18, 316L, 22.6. Six moly alloys are at 42.7. Your nickel alloys, like your alloy 22, is at 68%. The higher that number, the better for corrosion resistance and pitting that you have in this particular case. So that gives you kind of a ranking of the different alloys uh, that you have there. Now, when we're talking about crevice corrosion, uh, this is uh, where basically you have two areas put together that forms a crevice between two different surfaces. This can be uh, something as simple as flanged or threaded connections or something as simple as pieces of material bolted together. So if you look at this, this kind of shows you all the different crevices created just by doing a, a pattern of bolting two materials together. You have crevices where the bolt head is, crevices where the plates come together, and crevices all over this particular thing. So you can see where you might have a tack in that location if product gets underneath here. This is another area of where we create crevices. So if you look at this particular gasket surface, what typically you'll see, you know, whenever you go out into a plant process and you, uh, you know, gaskets are only designed to be hand tight. That's why we have those little wing nuts on those clamps. As you start to crank those things down, as they start to leak, what's the first thing people do is they crank them down a little bit more rather than replace them. As they leak uh, next time, they, they crank them down a little bit more. And then somebody had the bright idea to put a, uh, a hole in the center of that, uh, that clamp so somebody can get a screwdriver in there and really crank that thing down until it bottoms out. Well, that material has to go somewhere when that happens. And as you can see right here in this particular picture, it actually goes out into the product stream. Okay, now as your product flows against this particular gasket, it's going to seep back underneath that gasket and get in between this gasket and this flange face. Then what you're gonna end up with, you're gonna have a deteriorated gasket that you're gonna have product breaking off and going and getting into your, your uh, product going downstream. But then you're also gonna end up with a face on your uh, flange that looks something along those particular lines. So you have these areas that are corroded all around this, and this whole area then becomes anodic, and you, you've created another uh, anodic site for corrosion to start to take place. And as those metal ions are released, again, you're putting iron into the system, which can relate to rouge uh, further down the system. A little bit of a shameless plug for Holland. Uh, we do have a whole line of compression control gaskets and then uh, torque right clamps so that they don't over torque. Sometimes we see people use uh, live loaded nuts, different things to prevent just this from happening in addition to using the right material. Had to get my plug in. No problem. Another crevice that can take place that we don't a lot of times think about is actually product debris on the surface of the steel itself. This is an artificial crevice that is formed just by surface deposits on the surface of the steel. So what typically happens in this type of place when you have product buildup on the surface, you basically limit the oxygen supply underneath that debris. And you still have those areas of high chlorides that are trapped underneath that debris with the product itself. And when that happens with this deposit on the surface, you're limiting the oxygen supply underneath here. And this becomes very corrosive because of the concentration is increased underneath that deposit. So you can start to have a pit start to form at that location right there. So one of the things in showing this to keep in mind is that cleaning practices is something that is very, very important when it comes to the integrity and stewardship of equipment. So, uh, you know, if you're not getting all your product off then you, know, you can really have some issues when it comes to corrosion, uh, just this, uh, under crevice corrosion. Crevice uh, corrosion will take place at uh, some very low temperatures. In 304 stainless steel at minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit, 304 will grow, will uh, corrode. 316L at minus 10 degrees Fahrenheit, AL6XN at room temperature, 85 degrees Fahrenheit. You get into your higher nickel alloys and you're looking at higher temperatures before you start to see crevice corrosion taking place there. And with Anything like this type of corrosion, improving uh, the life by making the material thicker will not really help because you have to stop and think about what the pitting and crevice corrosion is, is really an attack to the passive layer. And once that starts to happen, it goes very, very quickly. 
Now, in this particular chart, it actually shows the critical crevice corrosion temperature uh, and the PREN number. It kind of gives you an idea of the ranking of the materials as well. So on the, on the bottom uh, axis, you see the PREN number calculation and where that actually falls on the graph. On the left-hand side is a critical crevice temperature uh, that uh, you might be seeing. And then on the right-hand side is an indication about how much uh, chloride parts per million can be withstood at those particular levels. So it, it's a chart that can kind of point you in the right, right direction when it comes to material selection. And, and that's what we're really looking at is material selection when you get right down to it in these corrosive applications. So that leads us into proper material selection and how and why do we do it. This is an example of a tank that was bought and put into service in the wrong application. Uh, if you can see this, you can see rust and corrosion taking place in that tank. This was after three months of service. That's how quickly it can, it can impact uh, a tank and, and go bad. Uh, I like to tell a story at this particular location uh, in this presentation of a issue I had when I was changing jobs one time. I, I was doing material selection work and I got a call from a customer asking me about uh, you know, what they should use for a, a tank. And I pointed them towards AL6XN based upon the product that they had in their tank. Obviously, AL6XN is a little bit more expensive and they didn't want to do that. So uh, they kept looking around. They found a materials engineer that said, okay, yeah, you can get by a 316, won't be a problem at all. Uh, so they bought the tank, they put it in, installation went in, all 316 stainless steel. I went to work for a company that did field remediation work. And the first call I got was that customer. Uh, where they had an issue with the tank and it had completely turned bright red and all the piping had eaten out. And in this particular case, what this was, it was a uh, chloride solution that was used to spray on peanuts, uh, honey roasted peanuts that had a high chloride content. And they didn't want to take the jump to do the proper material up front. They had to go back in, get the tank fixed, move it somewhere else in the system and replace all the piping and higher alloy from that location on. So again, a lot of times it's a lot more, it makes a lot more sense to spend the money up front and do the correct materials uh, rather than try to fix it later on down the line. So when we're talking about materials, one of the things you have to look at is the steel chemistry changes that's taken place over the last few years. 304 stainless steel and 316L stainless steel, if you look at the, the pre-1965 heats, you can actually see the chemical composition of these particular materials. The ASTM standard shows that in 316L stainless steel, you have to have 16 to 18% chromium, 10 to 14% nickel, and 2 to 3% molybdenum content. If you look at pre-1965 heats, you can see that we were running around 17.9 chromium, 12.4 nickel, and 2.4 molybdenum. After uh, 1965, they were able to start controlling these uh, alloy elements a little bit better. If you look at the current heats, it's coming in now, you're looking at about 16.3% uh, on chromium, 10.2% on nickel, 2.1% on molybdenum. So basically, the overall mean and corrosion resistance of the material has dropped over the last few years. You can see because they're able to control those alloying elements down to the bare minimums to meet the ASTM standards. And what replaces that is iron. So as our materials that gives us the corrosion resistance has dropped, uh, down, the iron content has gone up and therefore it creates an issue and we don't have steel that lasts in the same applications it may have, it may have looked at 60 years ago. I'm, so just, I'm just glad the millennials aren't getting blamed for stainless too, you know, at least, you know, this was 1965, you can't blame us for that, you know. <laughs> So if you look at what the alloying elements are, if you, if you look at the definition of stainless steel, and I know we're running out of time here, but if you look at the uh, stainless steel, uh, you have to have a minimum of 50% iron content by definition. 316 actually has about 64% iron. So what do these alloying elements do? 316L has 16 to 18% chromium content. That improves oxidation and resistance, prevents rust, changes the corrosion barrier from active film to a passive film. Nickel is an austenite former. It provides resistance to mineral acids. It causes that passive film to become tightly adhering on the surface of the steel. If you look at the uh, molybdenum content, it resists resistance to chlorides. 316L has two to 3% content. Nitrogen is an austenite former. It typically, 316L has 0%, but our six moly alloys do have a percentage of nitrogen in those, so that enhances that. 
So if you look at the cookbook, when you're talking about making steels, here's what we start off with. In the middle, we start off with an 18-8 stainless steel, just a straight grade 304 stainless steel. By adding these different alloying elements, you come up with different types of materials. So if you look uh, at this particular area, by adding uh, more molybdenum, two to three percent molybdenum content, you get a 316 stainless steel. You can reduce the carbon and get into your low carbon grade steels. You can add more molybdenum and add nickel and nitrogen and you get into your super austenitic stainless steels. So depending on what alloying elements you add to the base metals, you create a different melt of steel. And this is where it becomes critical when we're talking about UNS numbers. The ASTM standards require that you meet a specific minimum requirement in order to do that. That's why trade names, you know, yeah, they're, they're, they're meant to call out that, okay, you're gonna get this, but the UNS number basically guarantees you're going to get that for the ASTM standard. This is where the cleanability is set. This is where weldability is set. This is where the inclusion count is set. Everything is set at the mill uh, level. And this is where all stainless steel starts out. All starts out with about 80% scrap content. So typically what happens is you're having car doors, refrigerators, everything in the world going in to this, and you're creating a big melt of material with a lot of impurities in it that eventually gets uh, taken off of the surface. And you had all the other alloying elements into it to get your corrosion resistance. And this is kind of where we're starting off and how this ends up. And I'm, I'm pushing really hard because we're supposed to be done in like four minutes, right? No, you got 20 minutes left, Ken. You're doing oh, I do? Oh, okay. Yeah. Slow yeah. down then. Awesome. Yeah. No, keep going. I got some good questions coming up too. So when the old method and the reason that we weren't able to control these alloying elements uh, before, the old uh, method was used art melt uh, where they just basically used pure metals and uh, did the melt that way. In 1970s, they came out with AOD furnaces. And this was, this was what allowed them to control the carbon and sulfur. It also allowed them to have the great precise control of the alloying elements. So if you ever go to a steel mill and you're able to watch it, what you'll see is you'll see these people running around in their white hats taking samples of this particular material. They'll take that back to the lab, they'll run a test on it, and they'll look and see what they're making. And they say, okay, we need to add so many pounds of nickel, or we need to add so many pounds of molybdenum. And they'll start adding these different alloying elements. And as they add these alloying elements, they'll take additional samples and tests till they get the, the proper mix on the materials. Now, the reason that they have limited those alloying elements is just like anything else. That's the expensive part of steel. So they control their costs by controlling the addition of those higher alloying elements, which gives you the corrosion resistance. So by them controlling the cost that they need to and become profitable like everybody else, like we all want to be, you know, they, the overall corrosion resistance of material has gone down. So when we're talking about material selection, some of the things you have to look at are chlorides present. And if they are, use some of the charts and so forth that's available to you to go back and look and say, okay, what type of material should I be looking at? If you happen to know the pH of the product and you know the chloride parts per million, you can kind of chart it on a, on a graph like this and you can go, okay, I, I can see where I might need to use a six molly alloy or something along those lines. Same thing when it comes to looking at PREN numbers. You can go back and you can calculate the pitting resistance equivalency number and using these types of charts for critical crevice temperatures, you can go back and kind of plot on the graph and see where you need to be in those types of applications as well. Uh, Ken, we have a, one question from uh, uh, the peanut gallery, as I affectionately refer to our, our, uh, our viewers. Uh, says, um, this is from Dave McAvoy. Dave uh, is, a, is a friend. He's, uh, uh, and we, and that, it was right before this all started that Dave and I were sitting at a nice little brewery in, uh, in, uh, in um, uh, I think, Villa Park. And it, it, we had a really nice lunch. And it's too bad that we can't go back there right now while things are closed down. But Dave wants to know, do you know why some valves for chlorine service have steel bodies but Hasselloy trim? Is that just a cost saving measure? Is that, um, is it, does it have to do with crevice corrosion? Um, it, it probably has more to do with product contact. Uh -huh. uh, I mean, obviously as, as you make anything out of a higher alloy, it's gonna be more expensive. Uh, so uh, it could be a couple of things. It could be the fact that the, the uh, just as simple as what you're looking to make isn't available. 
And, you know, if you're thinking about making springs and those types of things, for instance, just throwing that out there, you may not be able to make a spring out of higher alloy. If you're talking about ball valves and those types of things, what you're really concerned about is the product contact. Now, if you're talking about a valve body, obviously that's going to be product contact. Uh, so as, as to answer that question as to why, I really don't know other than it's just a cost factor would be my only guess. I, I think that's it too. Yep. So whenever you're talking about material selection, inclusion of corrosion control uh, and, and the correct material selection at the design stage is the most efficient way when it comes to controlling corrosion. If corrosion control is not considered at the design stage and the correct material uh, is used, subsequent costs in order to repair that can be substantially higher than the initial investment of the material. So, you know, I, I certainly encourage everyone, if you're looking at new processes, uh, you know, do some corrosion studies, get a materials engineer involved if you have these types of applications, make sure you're picking the right materials uh, because a lot of times, yeah, it might be more expensive up front, but if you have to go back and, and replace this later on, uh, you're talking about a lot more material, you're talking about a lot of downtime and possibly even people being hurt. So uh, always look at material selection and always, always assume the worst case scenario when you're looking at different products. So why buy higher alloyed steels? But if you're looking at the ASTM classifications on what this is, uh, I'm comparing 316L stainless steel to six moly alloys to alloy 22 material. And you can see the UNS uh, requirements for these uh, shows that uh, we'll look at, uh, at these particular alloying elements. If you look at the big three, chrome, nickel, and molybdenum, 316, uh, 16 to 18%, nickel, 10 to 14%, molybdenum, 2 to 3%. If you look at the six moly alloys, you can see how much more substantial those alloying elements are in the six moly. Uh, instead of 16 to 18, 20 to 22 percent. Nickel, 23 and a half to 25 and a half. Molybdenum, six to seven percent. And then you get into your higher uh, alloys like alloy 22, you jump up to 22 percent chromium, 56 percent nickel, and 13 percent molybdenum content. So keep in mind what these alloying elements do, that's where you get your corrosion resistances from these particular three uh, products. But what you have to also keep in mind is as those numbers go up, so do the cost of the material, okay? Because that's what our steel mills are wanting to control are those alloying elements because that's where the expense is. So when you're talking about relative material prices, 304 stainless steel is a factor of one, 316L about 1 1.2 uh, times the cost. And we're talking about, this doesn't include any type of fabrication cost, just straight across the board material costs. Uh, six moly alloys, about five times the cost. Hast alloy, uh, alloy 22 products, about eight times the cost. You start putting fabrication costs into that, and it obviously can impact that much more depending on what you're doing. Uh, but it gives you a good idea uh, of what you're looking at when it comes to these types of alloying uh, elements. Uh, Ken, I wanted to ask a question that actually my, my boss has, so I have to make sure I get this in. Uh, Steve, Steve asks, Ken, do you see duplex alloys becoming uh, more widely used? It's uh, certainly a option. Uh, some companies have used duplex alloys uh, interchangeably with the six moly alloys. As far as corrosion resistance, they're along the same lines of a 904L stainless steel. Do I see them becoming more common? Uh, no. And the reason I say that is because right now they're being fabricated for the commercial market uh, where they're used, not for the sanitary market. The volume is not there at this particular point in time uh, for duplex steels. Could they be, be uh, modified and, and made to be used for sanitary? Absolutely, but you're talking about uh, a lot of costs in doing that. You're talking about mill runs of material. You're talking about uh, you know, uh, the special fittings and those types of things that have to be machined. You'd be talking about a lot large capacity of, of product to be bought. So uh, I would say no at this point in time when we have the other alloying elements that are already in place or there are other steels that are already in place that are being used. Uh, if you're talking about a non-sanitary applications, then absolutely they could be used. Uh, they could also be used in the fabrication of tanks. So in the past, we have done some tanks where we have made the tanks, uh, the base metal of the tank out of a duplex material, yet all the fittings installed in that tank were made out of a six moly alloy. So that you had the corrosion resistance of the, uh, more or less the 904L for, uh, 
uh, for the tank itself, but since those were not available in the fittings, you were able to step that up to a higher alloy in those types of applications. So. Uh, here's a question actually from uh, another good friend, uh, Randy Smith, ITT. Hi, Randy Smith. Uh, everyone likes Randy. Uh, Randy, I hope you're smoking a tri-tip this weekend. Uh, what role does temperature play in growth rate of corrosion on, uh, uh, on stainless steel surfaces? Well, temperature can certainly play an impact on it, but I don't think it's going to going to pay, play that huge of an impact when it comes to corrosion. Um, I mean, obviously, high temperatures can impact uh, those types of things, but uh, in in most applications of processing temperatures, we're not going to get above those, and I don't think it's going to be a real factor when it comes to corrosion in our industry. So moving forward with the corrosion study, this is a sample that we did where we actually welded some six moly tubing to six moly tubing using uh, an automatic fusion well with no insert ring. And I'm going to talk about insert rings in just a minute. We did a corrosion test of a G48 practice C test, which was 6% ferric chloride, 1% hydrochloric acid, held at uh, 50 degrees C for 72 hours. Now what we've done here, if you look at this top sample, this was a piece of tube that was uh, uh, well, just done a straight fusion weld on, then we split this tube long ways. We kept the top piece as just a controlled sample so we could see how it looked uh, before the corroding solution. And then we put the bottom piece in the corrosion solution. As you can see, this particular weld area started to, to be impacted in this particular area. It was basically eaten up and eaten away. And it's, uh, it's here at this location, on this particular location here, uh, it would have been probably uh, eaten up uh, pretty well uh, all over if we'd left it in there longer. So that shows you that the susceptibility to corrosion in the weld area is high when it comes to these types of uh, materials. One of the things that we can do uh, in order to combat that is you over, al over alloy these particular welds. So in this particular case, what we're using here is a weld insert ring made out of alloy 22. This is a flat washer style ring that basically fits in between the two pieces of tube, has the same OD and ID as the tube, and is about 40 thousandths thick. And like I said, it's made out of alloy 22. In this particular case, you do the same test and you can see there's absolutely no attack in the weld or the heat affected zone of the material itself. That by over alloying those welds, you put that high nickel into that weld area over alloying that and making it less corrosive uh, to the uh, product. This is another sample of a six molly tube welded to a six molly tube identical to the first weld that we did. In this particular case, we did not use a weld insert ring, but what we did do was a full solution anneal on the product. Okay, so we did that at, uh, after we did the welding at 2100 degrees Fahrenheit, followed by a rapid nitrogen quench. Now in this particular case, what happens, there was no corrosion that took place in this particular area. What this does by doing an annealing process is it rehomogenizes that weld area and distributes those properties throughout that metal again, giving that corrosion resistance similar to the base metal back across the weld. Now, the only reason we talk about this is because this isn't something you can typically do in a field application if you're doing a, a welding of tubing and piping put together. But what happens is we take this in, in our applications in a fabrication setting like a fitting manufacturer, for instance, like us. If we were going to take a, a elbow and, and we were going to make a weld by clamp elbow and we had a hundred of these things to make, we could do a straight a fusion weld on that, send that whole batch out for annealing, and be less expensive when it comes to the fabrication over doing a weld insert ring at each of these locations. So for in those types of applications, that's where it comes into play in the solution annealing uh, type thing. If you're going to do one or two fittings, uh, then in that particular case, it might be more advantageous to use a weld insert ring and, and do those welds. Uh, so when it comes to V and E, for instance, if we're going to do any type of special fabrication at our facility, in most cases, uh, we're doing small quantity uh, product fabrication for a customer that maybe need a one-off on a special fitting or something, then we're gonna use a weld insert ring uh, and uh, do that at that uh, welding area. 
And then this is a 316 L tube welded to a six molly alloy, automatic fusion weld, no insert ring, no anneal. This shows a couple of things. Uh, first off, it shows that the 316L is certainly more susceptible to corrosion. You can see pitting all over the surface of that 316L. Uh, but the, one of the questions that always comes up is, well, do I have to over alloy that weld when I'm putting that type of uh, joint together? And, and secondly, can I make that type of joint? Well, yes, you can make the type of joint. And do you need to use a weld insert ring? Some people will tell you, yes, you need to use a weld insert ring. Some people want to sell you weld insert rings. I tell you, I don't think that you do. Uh, and the reason being, if you look at this particular weld, what you're going to see is the attack of the corrosion took place in the 316L side. It didn't take place in the weld. It didn't take place on the, on the AAL6XN material. It took place on the 316 to the heat affected zone side of the 316 stainless steel. What good does it do to spend $20 for a weld insert ring when your base metal is going to corrode once it gets past that? So uh, my, my point in saying this is no, you don't need a weld insert ring. What you need to do is you need to make this joint in a, in a location outside of your corrosion uh, issues that you're taking place before you do this type of a weld. And then you're going to get enough of a material interface on this weld area from the over alloyed material in the three six in the AL6XN to the 316, you're going to get enough homogenation from these higher alloys in the AL6XN to improve that weld area uh, over the 316 in that particular area. Uh, Ken, there's a question from Alex yep. I just asked uh, just a moment ago. What uh, what was the tube exposed to? The one that you're showing now? It's 6% ferric chloride and 1% hydrochloric acid. And then one, one other question I wanted to get to for Alex, because I, I promised him we would, um, was, um, and, and maybe you're coming to it, so I apologize if we're jumping ahead of it, but yep. your six molly fittings, the BPE ones, what are the RA values that you typically get? Are they the same as what we get for your max pure line? Or Yep, uh, so, so we're stocking our, our high alloys uh, in 20 RA uh, mechanical polish, and 20RA EP. Now our tubing, we're actually stocking that uh, in uh, 15RA on the uh, mechanical, I'm sorry, 20RA on the mechanical and 15RA on the EP. Uh, now, can we offer 15RA EP on the fittings? Yeah, we can, but we decided that it was better to go ahead and stock the 20RA. Uh, that's, that's where we see most of the applications at. If we need to improve that, uh, that surface finish, we can. Got it, thanks. So when you're talking about doing wells and six molly alloys, I'm, now I'm starting to run out of time, aren't I? Mm -hmm. um, so basically you wanna over alloy fill wells by using a weld insert ring. If you can't use a weld insert ring, then you can also use a weld wire. You don't have to use a weld insert ring. A weld wire works just as well as a weld insert ring. Uh, we won't get into the uh, heat treatment and so forth. Um, Whenever you're, uh, we're going to skip past this because we're running out of time and we don't have time to get into surface finishes. We can do this another time if you want to. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, you want to take a minute, Ken? Uh, just uh, if, if anyone has any questions, feel free to chime in. Uh, obviously, you know, there is no hard stop. So, so, so uh, the, I, I have unlimited minutes on Zoom. I did pay for the premium package. So it's, um, it's all good. But I, I wanted to take a minute and just talk a little bit about um, because it's important to, to the people at Holland and I think a number of other fabricators, um, fabrication and, and what sort of fabrication considerations uh, we have for six molly fittings that we wouldn't have for 316L. I know, Ken, I've, I've tried to pin you down a hundred times on when I'm estimating this stuff, how much more time should I assume from a fabrication standpoint? Um, wh what do you, um, What's your answer on it uh, today? <laughs> well, you know, I, again, I, I'm going to be like like uh, any metal artist out there and say, well, it depends. So, uh -huh. <laughs> you know, I mean, here's the bottom line. When you're talking about doing this particular type of fabrication, the only thing that you're really doing differently, mm -hmm. uh, it welds very similar, okay? You're using pretty much the same welding parameters that you use in, in 316L stainless steel. Your real impact comes in the fit up of the weld insert rings and those types of things. That's that's where the time really comes into place. Does it take a little bit more to polish it? Yeah, it takes just a little bit more to polish it. Probably negligible. 
but the real impact comes in the fit up of and the over alloying of the wells. So that's dependent upon how much you do. If I was going to say, uh, as far as an estimate goes, when it comes to labor, mm -hmm. I would say roughly about 12 to 15 percent more time. Okay, that, that's really helpful to know because uh, I can give you a, a perspective from a system fabricator. Uh, one of the issues that we see when we estimate this is not just cost, but if, if we don't have really good numbers for our for uh, uh, how much longer it takes, let's say we say, oh, we're going to double it, right? When we estimate a system, let's say we, 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 you know, one of the shortcuts we use is we count the number of valves and then we weld, uh, then we count the number of uh, valves and we take that, multiply it by a number and that gives us our labor, our piping hours. And if we're using a 2x multiplier uh, for the number of hours uh, per valve, uh, because we're using AL6 instead of 316L, not only is that going to have a huge cost impact, uh, that may make that may actually lead somebody not only to us not getting a job, but maybe to using a, or to going with a 316L because they go, oh my gosh, it's so much less. I could buy the system twice before I could buy the right. ALX have one. It may lead them to make a poor material selection, but not as it only a pricing issue, it becomes a scheduling issue. And then all, yep. of, our, all of a sudden our skids, instead of being uh, commercially viable at a 12 to 18 to 20 week lead time, now we're talking about something. We say, look at these hours, it's gonna be 25, 30, 40 weeks. And that just isn't gonna do it. Um, one question from uh, David, from Dave McAvoy again. Um, are these fittings made in the USA? Uh, how important is country of origin for base metal and finished product? Uh, our, our BPE meetings, our, our BPE uh, fittings are made in Israel at our ASME B, uh, BPE facility, and it's typically not an issue coming from Israel as far as country of origin. Most of our fittings that we, we supply from VNE come from that location. Uh, where, where does the raw material come from? The raw material can come from different locations. Uh, the, a lot of the tubing that we, we use is domestic material from the U.S. Yep. Uh, it, it, depending on what type of alloys that we're doing, 904L uh, product and some of the Alloy 22 product, we're using European uh, mm -hmm. material on. But again, we have purchasing specifications when it comes to that that we have in place that require specific requirements for the material that we buy. Uh, so that our raw material is, is, is to our specification and what we want and what we need. Understood, Understood. very good. Um, okay, great. And if anybody wants to stay on and go on the surface finish, we can do it. It's entirely up to you guys. It takes yeah. about maybe 10 minutes. Okay. Well, why don't we keep going with that? Obviously, anybody, if, if you have any questions, feel free to chime in. Otherwise, we, we do thank you for attending. But uh, I, I mean, let me put it this way. I still got another hour before I can even think about leaving. So I'm, I'm, I'm happy to learn some more as long as, Ken, you're, you're, you, you got time to share it with us. Absolutely. All right. So what we're going to talk about now is surface finish when it comes to higher alloys. And how does that, how does that impact? Well, first off, let me back up just a second. Did we answer your question? Uh, and you've done some fabrication with AL6XN. Yeah. What, what do you think? I mean, you've, you've done some of this. Are you seeing it in the same time frame? Uh, yes, I, I think we are. Um, yeah. So it, that, that was a mistake that we'd often make where we, we take our hours and we double it. And then we make these great margins and, uh, and everyone pats themselves on the back for, you know, how much money we made on the job. Right. And, and in, in reality, I'm, I'm, probably going to get a lot of flack from my sales team for saying this. It's more important to me to know what the true cost is going into it than to mm -hmm. overestimate uh, on the front end, potentially not get a job. And then, and then, uh, you know, I think that's sort of disingenuous. So yeah. our, our time studies, when, when we've done it, we've looked back at it are in that 15 to 20% range. Yeah. Um, when you look at it, even if you're talking about, uh, you know, adjusting an orbital weld uh, program to maybe run a little bit slower, I mean, you're, you're, you're talking a, a couple of seconds for a yeah. future well, right? It, it's not a big difference. Uh, to, to your point, the, the biggest place where we're going to see increased labor, we're, you know, it, it all cuts at the same speed. So it, it doesn't cut any faster or slower. So from a fabrication standpoint, it's just as easy. Now, we do make sure that the guys who are fabricating it are really good because you don't want to, uh, you know, yeah. lose a fitting, right? But yeah. um, you don't want to mess up. You don't want to mess up too much. Yeah, absolutely. Right. All right, uh, but um, uh, from a welding standpoint, from a fabrication standpoint, yeah, it's, it's really in the fixturing and the setup time. Yeah. It's in the 15 to 20% range, I would say. So yeah, if, if it usually takes an hour, we might estimate it at an hour and 10 minutes instead yeah. of 
that's what I said. I think I think anywhere between twelve to fifteen percent is probably the number that 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 falls into line here. So. The only other thing that we try to tell people is um, is a lot of times they'll have a video requirement where they want us to boroscope the welds, and we do try to tell people these welds aren't quite as pretty as the three sixteen, yep. right? They're they're a little yep. bit uglier, but they're still acceptable. So. Yeah, and and to be honest with you, I'm glad you brought that up because one of the things that we we've done at BPE is we've acknowledged the fact that because of the high nickel and from the uh, weld insert rings, you may have some uh, weld dross and so forth that shows up on the surface of that and in this uh, colored splotching on the surface in those wells. And we've actually gone in and, and addressed that in BPE so that uh, it is there uh, because we know we do know it's a, a uh, just one of the byproducts of using these high nickel alloys when it comes to over over alloying that. So yep. uh, it is there, and as long as you can explain it to your customer and you can point them in the direction that uh, right. that you have that issue, uh, it's pretty well acceptable. Yep. yep. So when we're talking about material selection, or I'm sorry, uh, material surface finishes, this is a 20RA mechanical polished surface. Okay. So when we're talking about that, if you look at this 20RA mechanical polished surface, you can see the cuts and grooves from the stand paper that you're seeing there. You can see some areas of the material that's folded over itself and so forth. This next slide shows a 20RA electro polished surface. Okay. All of that damaged area has been removed and you just have a nice smooth featureless surface. This is a 2B sheet metal, 10RA. You can see the grain boundaries uh, pretty well. This is at a 1500 magnification. If you look at a 2B electro polished 1500X magnification, all those grain boundaries have been reduced and smoothed out so that you no longer see that. Whenever you're doing a mechanical polishing and sanding process in order to achieve an RA value, you're actually damaging the surface of that particular steel. Uh, that damaged layer will include things like smeared over abrasives, material compounds, irons, contaminants, all types of things, paint, dye, greases, etc., all from that mechanical finishing process. And it will actually go down into depths of the material. There was a study done by a gentleman by the name of Jay Wolf that actually looked at uh, home surfaces, ground surface, which is mechanically polished surface, and an electro polished surface to look at the different levels of de deformation. And what he found was on a mechanically polished surface, which is the ground surface, seven different layers on the surface of that particular steel, anywhere from oxides to cone deform ferrite, all the way down to austenite on the surface of the steel. If you look at the electro polished surface, he found that all of that damaged layer was removed and the only thing left on the surface of the steel was uh, austenite. So if you look at that damaged layer in the magnification, you can actually see on the uh, 180 grit sanded surface down to a, a, a certain depth, you can actually see cuts, grooves, and damaged layer down on the surface of that particular steel. This is a 180 grit surface that had been electro polished and you see none of that damaged layer on the surface of that particular steel. This is a little higher magnification showing an 80 grit sanded mill plate and the damaged surface. You can see the, the striations along the top and the folded over metal, and you can see the damaged layer going down into this particular surface all the way down into these areas, uh, down into these grain boundaries here. This is a 1500 magnification of 180 grit mechanical polished surface. This is what the sandpaper and sanding process does to this particular steel. Now here's what's important when you stop and think about this for just a second. When we talk about stainless steel in particular, we're talking about 64% iron content, okay? As we're going across and we're mechanically polishing this and we're removing this dust and this debris from the surface of the steel, all that grinding dust that you're leaving on the surface that's gets down into these grooves of the material that's being folded over and trapped over top of itself is 64% iron, loose iron that could become contaminated and, and become mobile within the system if it's not removed. This is a white light interferometric analysis that shows the topographical look at what that looks like. So if you look at this red line going across this, uh, this graph right here on the top left, this is where this red line on the bottom looks like. That's what the topographical surface of that looks like. This is an 11.5 RA reading. So if you look at that, you stop and think about the peaks and the valleys at these particular locations, you're talking about a lot of surface area going up and down and up and down across the surface of that steel. 
This is the same white light interferometric analysis after an electropolished surface. This is a 2BEP. You can see how much smoother that is across the surface. So let's go back for just one second when we're talking about electropolishing. What do we do? So electropolishing is really nothing more but a controlled corrosion process. Okay. You basically have your vessel that is becoming the anode. Your electropolishing tool is basically your cathode. Your electrolyte is, is your electrolyte on the surface of the steel. So what you're actually doing is all you're doing is removing these peaks from the surface of the steel down to the valleys. So you're basically eating off these high points and removing those down to the low end of the steel. So by doing that, you're not actually reducing the thickness of the material because your thickness of the material is already down at this particular location. All you're doing is smoothing it out. So both of these surfaces here are 20RA. When you get right down to it, which do you think is going to be better for your system? Probably the one with the EP. Yeah, it wouldn't, wouldn't, doesn't take long to, to show a point. Now, when we're also talking about doing uh, uh, surface roughness measurements, a lot of times, you know, we'll go in and we'll take a profilometer and we'll put that across the surface of that steel. Mm -hmm. A profilometer has a diamond tip on the end of it. And when you run that across the surface of that steel, that's what you end up with. That's what you leave back behind. So you're taking your good, smooth, electro-polished surface and you're running a profilometer across it and you're leaving a damaged layer on the surface of that particular steel that you can't see. So a lot of times whenever we're doing these types of measurements, uh, when, we were, when I was out uh, doing this in the field, we'd make sure those RA measurements were there before we ever did the EP uh, in order to make sure they were correct. Now, I'm not saying don't do this because you're talking about a minimal area. And yes, stainless steel will repassivate itself to a certain extent over time. So uh, something along this line, if you allow it to uh, to, re to set in air, is not going to be a, a real problem. Okay. But you are scratching the surface when you, you use it. You are scratching the surface, absolutely. There is a question, another question here from Alex. Alex asks, do you think that Alloy 22 uh, would need EP? No. no. Well, it, let me back up. That's a, that was a quick note. Here's the, here's the problem. For, cor for improved corrosion resistance, no. Mm -hmm. For releasability characteristics, it could. Okay, I, I understand. And, and I guess here's a question that I have, because I, I, I'm, uh, I feel like sometimes there's a misconception here. Does electropolishing improve surface finish? Um, yes. Yes. So what, what do you, I don't understand your question. Well, I don't so, so a lot of times we'll, uh, you know, we'll have somebody and, and they'll say, um, Oh, you know, yeah, it's 32 RA, and if you just EP it, it's oh, going okay. to go to yeah. 20. I see where you're going. Yes, so absolutely. Yes, so what happens is electropolishing will reduce the RA value by roughly, depending on the material that you're, you're electropolishing, it will reduce the, the RA values in most cases, typically by about 40%. So, you know, if, you're, uh, if you've got a 20 RA and you're going to EP something, you'll end up a lot of times down around a, a 13, 14, 15 RA value on it. And then uh, one other thing from uh, John George, and he just wants to point out, um, uh, well, we are talking mostly about specialty alloys, Viennese Max Pure line, their, their line of standard 316L BPE fittings. Uh, all the materials for that product line are manufactured domestically. Uh, and certified from ASME BP uh, tube manufacturers, uh, a couple of which I think are not too far from where uh, That's uh, correct. Uh, 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 John's facility in Janesville is. Yep, absolutely. So when we're talking about electropolishing, all the materials can pretty well uh, benefit from that. Uh, so, you know, you asked about C22. Yeah, it will actually smooth it, but will it improve the corrosion resistance? No, but it will improve the surface characteristics of the material when it comes to releasability. Uh, and same thing with all these other alloys. So if you look at the, uh, the six moly alloys and look at the same thing that we just looked at, you can actually see very similar characteristics as compared to 316L. This is a six moly alloy received at 1,000 magnification. Uh, you look at the uh, YRA value on that where the, the red line runs across, you still, still see the same types of uh, peaks and valleys on a uh, uh, as received material. It will mechanically polish pretty much the same way and leave the same type of damaged layer back behind.
But keep in mind, even with a six moly alloy, even though that you have those levels of higher chromium, nickel, and molybdenum, it is still an alloy of iron, and you still have a high alloy uh, iron content of, of around 50, I want to say it's around 52, 54%, something like that. So with that being said, you still have the same issues of if you allow this grinding swarf to get into the system, uh, it will uh, create rouge within the system. Now, a lot of times people say, well, can't I just passivate that and remove it? Yes, a lot of times it will. But in mechanically polished surfaces, if everyone will remember back, uh, it's probably been four or five years ago now, there was a real problem with a, everybody was had with black residue on the surface of their steel. They'd go in, they'd, they'd uh, clean it, They'd go back a couple days later, take a, a white, run across it, you have a black residue on it. What that was, was grinding swarf basically coming out of this particular material from these striations. And that will continue to bleed out over time. Uh, passivation will help to remove it, but it won't remove it all. And again, this is a uh, mechanically polished uh, 6XN, same type of thing that you see, same thing with AL6XN. Uh, and then, of course, after uh, electropolishing, you get a nice, smooth, featureless surface. So you can get the same type of benefits for these higher alloys that you do with 316L stainless steel. So they certainly can be electropolished uh, to a satisfactory result. So with that, that's the end. I appreciate your, uh, your attention and your uh, uh, participation. Great. Any questions? Any questions from anybody else? Uh, we still actually, you know, I appreciate you guys hanging on. I know we went a little bit long, but it looks like most of you stayed in. So we, we really appreciate it. And um, I want to say thank you, Ken, for um, for your time this afternoon. I, I learned a lot. I think I, uh, you know, I actually, we got, I got all my questions answered. So um, awesome. Well, thanks guys a lot. Enjoy your weekend. Stay safe, stay healthy. And um, if you have any questions for Ken, oh, well, a question. Oh, we just a compliment, actually. Fantastic presentation. Thank you very much. Oh, and, uh, we will put this up on YouTube for everyone to review. And um, have a great weekend. Make sure you wish your mother a happy Mother's Day. And um, uh, I know I wish my mom a happy Mother's Day, but I don't think she's going to watch this, so that's okay. Yeah. Um, all right. Thanks a lot, Ken. We, uh, Cheers, we everybody. Cheers.